اهلا وسهلا ابو هاي خواني بين بين دو Welcome to Accent, the first international show produced at the University of Kansas. I'm Max. And I'm Yekaterina Lisovskaya, with today's news, events, and trends from all over the world. On Wednesday, the South Korean military reported that North Korea had fired the highest amount of short-range missiles in a day. As many as 23 were fired. 2006 and 2009 were the last times this many missiles were fired. Exact numbers for these dates are unknown. These actions have further increased tensions in the area. U.S. citizen and Florida resident is stuck in prison in Saudi Arabia. Saad Ibrahim Al-Madi was arrested for a series of tweets he published criticizing Saudi Arabian government. He posted over the course of a few years while he was in the U.S. He went to see his family in November 2021. There he was taken from the airport and has been in Saudi Arabian prison ever since. He has been sentenced to 16 years. On Sunday, Brazil elected their new president, but one not new to the office. Fernando Silva has all the details on that. Fernando, what's the feeling among Brazilians after the election? Thank you, Max. Things in Brazil are a little tense right now. After the former president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, was elected for the third time, the supporters of Jair Bolsonaro, current president of Brazil, are organizing anti-democratic protests all over the country. On Sunday, leftist Lula was elected with 50.9% of the votes against 49.1% for Bolsonaro, the right-wing incumbent. Nearly two days after the results were announced, Bolsonaro broke the silence with a short speech. He did not explicitly say that he recognizes his loss, but it seems like the government will cooperate with the transfer of power. But even though Lula was elected democratically, Bolsonaro supporters are blocking important highways, creating gigantic traffic jams in Brazil. Flights were forced to be canceled. Some grocery stores are already reporting shortages of projects, and even patients who are going through dialysis and chemotherapy were not able to make it to their treatment. These protesters are calling on the military to keep the fried right leader in power, a clear violation of the Brazilian constitution. On Wednesday, Bolsonaro asked his supporters to use a different means to protest. Back to you guys. Thank you, Fernanda. Let's hope the unconstitutional protest will cease in Brazil. On our last show, we saw what the Jayhawks knew about Germany. This week, we'll take a look at another country, Vietnam. Let's see how they do this week. Sing ciao, Jayhawks. This is Yekaterina, and today we will find out what KU students know about Vietnam. First, let's see if they can tell where Vietnam is on the map. It's like in this area. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't think, I know like one's Laos. I don't. Mm. It's like somewhere in this region, I know that. Camera. Right, somewhere in that little area. Okay. It's hard, it's like next to a Laos, so there you go. Around here, but I could yeah. not point it out specifically. Is Where is the rough area? <laughs> <laughs> uh, in here, in this area, if I had to guess. I'm going to say right there. Mm -hmm. Great, great. We can find Vietnam in Southeast Asia along the eastern coast of Indochinese Peninsula, bordering China in the north, Laos and Cambodia in the west. What's the capital of Vietnam? Uh, it's like Ho Chi Minh City, I can't remember, I do, do not know. <laughs> Is it Laos? No? Oh, I know this. Um... Never mind. I might pronounce it wrong, but Hanoi? Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> London. <laughs> Hanoi is the capital of Vietnam. Approximately the population of the capital is 5 million people. The road traffic in Hanoi is known to be crazy, but it's organized chaos. The crossings in Hanoi is unlike anywhere in the world. Let's see now if the Chehawks know Vietnam's official language. Vietnamese, right? Vietnamese. I'll trust my instincts. I'll go Vietnamese. <laughs> I believe Vietnamese. Vietnamese? I'm assuming Vietnamese. They did a pretty good job. 
No matter how obvious it may sound, Vietnamese is indeed their official language. Finally, we'll see if they have tried any dish from Vietnam. It was some type of like candy, but it was like a homemade like sweet, like it wasn't actually like a store-bought candy. It's one that they kind of made at home. Probably pho, you know, really good. My roommate just made me um, a Vietnamese lemonade with limes and vinegar. So it was pretty good. It reminded me of the lemonade that I get in Mexico. I actually used to go and get pho with like a bunch of people. I like pho noodles. Mm-hmm. If that counts. Yeah, pho. Yes, pho. I mean pho. But that's like the most basic answer. Pho is the most popular answer. It is a Vietnamese soup typically made from beef stock and spices to which noodles and thinly sliced beef or chicken are added. Sounds delicious. There are a few Vietnamese restaurants in Lawrence where you can try it. There are more fun things we can learn about Vietnam, but that's all we have for you today. We hope you had fun. Former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is about to be re-elected. 86% of the votes have been counted, with Netanyahu set to win 65 out of 120 seats. However, he is relying on the support of the Re Religious Zionism Party, an ultra-nationalist group with a leader that has been convicted of incitement to racism and supporting a terrorist organization. Netanyahu himself is also on trial for alleged bribery, fraud, and breach of trust, all of which he denies. After the break, we'll learn more about what's happening over the globe. You may not hear it at first, but it's there. Our chant, rising. On this summit, callings converge. Voices unify into a chorus. That sounds out for good. For greatness. Can you hear it? Welcome back to Accent. A few days ago, there in the US, we celebrated Halloween, a happy and fun holiday. However, in South Korea, Halloween was far from happy. 156 people died in Seoul when more than 100,000 flocked to the popular nightlife district of Taiwan on Saturday for Halloween celebration. It was the first no masks required event since the country's strict COVID-19 restrictions were lifted. In Kansas City, a project helps refugees to grow hope when farming. Reporter Fernanda Silva will show us the impacts of new routes for immigrants from Myanmar. New Routes for Refugees is a four-year training program for refugees and former refugees who have agricultural experience in their home country and want to start their own farm business in the U.S. Agriculture is a big part of many cultures and so a lot of uh, families that have come from other cultures have uh, really a wealth of knowledge of agriculture and um, agricultural practices and so want to put that uh, to use to benefit um, their families and the, and the community in Kansas City by um, starting small farms. Refugees from Myanmar began resettling into the United States in large numbers around 2008. According to Refugee KC, 3,000 of the refugees from the country now call Kansas City home. As Ko saw, who came to the United States in 2015, other refugees also find in farming the hope they needed. Uh, before I'm born, and then the, our country, the, like something correct, something that really bad um, government. So we not safe, not very safe. And then because that we are like a small group or small people and then uh, they are the bum, usually Burma, they are the majority and then we are minority. So they press us everything, religion and then everything. Uh, they look down us. At the end of 2020, the United Nations Refugee Agency estimated that there were 1.1 million refugees from Myanmar in different parts of the world, making them the fourth largest refugee population. When immigrating, the refugees from Myanmar leave behind a country that has for decades been ruled by a military regime and pummeled by natural disasters. But arriving in a new country, adjusting to a new culture, dealing with the language barrier and with the missing home can also be challenging. I go to school and then so I learn, but the, the first day I came to the airport and then they come and pick up and then like uh, mm, uh, social worker come in and then she come to talk and then I can't, I don't understand because they like, you know, but I read okay, 
uh, read, uh, you know, depend on me, so it's a little bit slow, okay, but the talking you know, is it really hard. So we do, uh, in the winter time, we teach uh, English for farming, um, so teaching vocabulary for farming and for markets to help people be more comfortable communicating with customers at market or with staff. Um, but alongside of that, yeah, we do provide interpretation so that people can um, listen and, and contribute um, comfortably in their own language. To make it easier for refugees, they usually are sent to cities where their family members or friends already live. Came straight to uh, Kansas City. Uh, we have a family member who came early than us. Uh, like uh, a year or so and then when we about to came to USA like the government over there just uh, placed you wherever the seat at the state at so uh, when you told that you have a family member that live in here uh, they can arrange you the uh, resettlement in here so since we already have a family member that live a year early than us we just told that okay we have a family that live here we want to come and live with them so they rearrange us and then we have place in Kansas City when families arrive in Kansas City, um, someone from Catholic Charities will pick them up at the airport and take them to their apartment um, that we've set up with the help of donations and volunteers. Um, and then case managers will assist them in enrolling their children in school, finding jobs. Uh, we have English classes and things like that. And those services continue for about five years um, after the family arrives. And so New Roots is just uh, an option for refugee families as one of the programs. Here in Kansas City, the immigrants from Myanmar plant vegetables that are not easy to find in the area, but that make them think of home. In here, American, they don't grow a lot of uh, like uh, Asia, Asia vegetables. So we have the um, chimbao, which is like a sour type leaf, as one of the farmer explained it, Rosa. Uh, that's the type of uh, veggie uh, vegetable that really popular in Burma. In here, uh, American don't really know. So every time they eat that, they I will say they probably think it back home and uh, think it back in Burma. So you can do like in that chimbao, you can do a lot of things. Like you can do a soup, you can stir fry them, you can do whatever you want with that. So that's what they like. Besides planting for themselves, these farmers are also encouraged to sell their products in local farm markets. This has been Fernanda Silva reporting for Accent. Thank you, Fernanda. Now let's take a look at some local and international weather. Thank you both. I'm Erin Borges here with a weather update. We have two hurricanes active right now. We have Hurricane Lisa and Hurricane Martin. And then locally, we have some chances for thunderstorms on Friday. So let's go ahead and take a look at Hurricane Lisa. It is off the coast of Belize right now, looking to make landfall sometime Wednesday. And it's going to affect, of course, Belize and that south, south eastern tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. We are expecting some storm surge, of course, heavy flooding, heavy rain, lots of strong winds, and it's going to continue on that path that you can see there as it progresses in its life. So we are going to keep an eye on this as it keeps happening. And then we have a second hurricane to, hurricane to look out for, but luckily Hurricane Martin is out in the Atlantic Ocean and very far away from land masses at the moment but hurricane martin is looking like it's going to stay a hurricane pretty for a while um, it's a category one right now and it's looking to stay that for a while take a right hook and then go off to the northeast a bit more as time progresses so those are just two hurricanes that are happening out in the both oceans there and then locally, of course, on this Thursday morning, it is about 68 degrees and we are warming up to some warmer temperatures in the 70s today. The wind is staying strong out of the south southeast at 21 miles per hour. And it's going to be like that all during today with some very strong winds. We're looking at speeds in the upper 20s and even low 30s for some of those gusts. The temperatures are still going to be upper 70s, so it'll feel nice today, definitely, but it's going to be strong winds that you're going to be feeling, and that leads us into Friday, where we have more chance for rain, and we are going to see that rain come through, and then later on in Friday evening, Friday afternoon, we're going to start to see those thunderstorms kind of line up out to the west, and then eventually move closer to our area as we go through that Friday 
evening. Right now, we are not looking at a severe risk for or a risk for severe weather yet. It is just going to be some thunderstorms that we're keeping an eye on. But do keep in mind that you should keep uh, local warnings in your in the back of your mind as we go through Friday evening. And then here is the seven day forecast just to take a full look at everything. So Friday, Saturday, some storms. Saturday might be finishing up that little bit of rain. And then Monday and Sunday, sunny. But we again have some more rain coming Tuesday and Thursday. So we are not through with the rain yet, but we are also not through with the sunshine yet. So that is all I have for our weather update. Back to you both. Thank you, Erin. A brief update on the war in Ukraine. According to Ukrainian military intelligence, Iran is planning to send 200 combat drones to Russia. This includes the Arash-2, a very dangerous drone. This could further pressure Ukraine's air defenses, which have already shot down over 300 attack drones. Concerning news for the country. The European continent is warming up at the fastest pace at any region in the world. It's double the global average, according to a new report by UN's World Meteorological Organization. Temperatures in Europe have risen dramatically over the period from 1991 to 2021, warming by about one half a degree centigrade per decade. Next, reporting Kristen Howell talked to Eric Toller, an employee of Bellingcat, a Dutch paste company that conducts open source research. Let's hear what he has to say. Welcome back. I'm here with Eric Toller, and you work for Bellingcat. Can mm -hmm. you tell us what that is? What do you do? Sure. So we're a Dutch based company, and we have people all over. I'm in Kansas City, so I'm not too far away. And what we do is we do open source research on world events. So open source research is basically a fancy way of saying like social media, satellite images, just basically anything you can find online that you can do research on. So the way that works is like, for example, the war right in Ukraine. It's a big thing we're looking into yeah. as of late. So um, we don't have obviously anyone on the ground in Ukraine because mm -hmm. we don't want them to be killed. So <laughs> what we do is we have a tiny bit. So <laughs> we do research through um, social media posts, YouTube videos, witness accounts on apps like Telegram, which is mm -hmm. a messaging platform. And we piece them together to find out what's happening. So if there's like a missile strike on a railway station, we say there's remnants. You can see pictures and videos of the missile remnants. Mm -hmm. You can see satellite imagery of where the launch happened. Sometimes there's special imagery showing like heat signatures, things like that. Yeah. Um, so you piece all that together into an investigation. So yeah. um, I've been doing this since about 2015. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, the world's changed a lot in the last seven years. Oh, um, it definitely has. But there's been a lot of cases for this um, to be especially um, ripe for investigation. Yeah, what has been the most unique story you've had in the past couple of years? Um, so probably the biggest story we've worked on is the um, looking to the poisoning of Alexei Navalny, who mm. was the um, he was the leading um, opposition figure in Russia. So he was the the big anti-Putin guy. He's in jail right now, but he was poisoned um, in um, a couple of years ago, and yeah. he was in Siberia. And we figured out exactly who poisoned him because we well, there's a whole bunch of reasons why, but in short. <laughs> In Russia, data is not um, like it is in the U.S. Mm -hmm. You can buy people's phone records, their travel records, their passport information. You can't do that in the U.S. Yeah. Even you know, you'd have to be a very corrupt cop or something to do <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But in Russia, it's Russia. It's 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 nothing. Everything mm -hmm. is possible there. And we did this, and we figured out the poisoners who poisoned him, which were people from the Russian Internal Security Service, the mm -hmm. FSB, which is kind of like the American, like the Russian version of the FBI, basically poisoned yeah. him. And we published it. Um, there's a documentary on HBO about this. It's at HBO Max, if you ever want to watch. It's called Navalny. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so then we kind of worked with him. At, well, we figured out ahead of time, then we gave him the information. And then the big culmination of the investigation is Navalny um, called one of his poisoners and basically prank called him and pretended to be his bot, like the, the boss of the boss of the boss of the poisoner, <laughs> and got yeah. him to admit over the phone call about what happened. So that was kind of the wow. big climax of the investigation. That is really, really cool yeah. and interesting. I also hear you're a KU grad. Mm -hmm. So what was your life like as a KU student? Sure. What did you major in? What was, what was yeah. it like? So I started here in 2006 is when mm -hmm. I was first year as undergrad. I did English and Slavic languages and literatures for undergrad. And then I stayed on for a master's as well. And I did Slavic languages and literatures as well. And I did Russian, um, Russian literature, Russian linguistics for my master's. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was here in 08 for the, fir for the most, re for the, not the most recent basketball, <laughs> yeah, but the, the <laughs> second most recent title and for the Orange Bowl as well too. So it's kind of strange coming back here. We're 5-0 in football, which is yeah. great. I haven't lost since March. Um, so it's a little bit of a flashback of 2008 so far. Of, yeah, it's um, how like going, going back in time with athletics. And yeah, yeah. 
certainly not on campus. Campus has changed quite yeah. a lot. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, how has your um, like master's degree, your mm -hmm. bachelor's, how has that helped you in your job today? Yeah, I mean, I use it. I you know I have to learn Russian to do this work. I was yeah. on the the final um, the final trip study abroad trip that KU had to St. Petersburg in Russia back wow, in 2010. Wow, yeah, that's really awesome. So we did this for years and years, and I was on the final trip out there. So I learned Russian. Um, I did a second study abroad trip later when I was in grad school, but mm -hmm. I was did a study abroad um, at KU to Russia, and um, I can't go to Russia anymore. I'm banned, but I at least got to go a couple of times <laughs> yeah. thanks to um, KU here, and I. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I use it every day for my work. I read Russian, I listen to Russian, I write Russian every day for my work because I work with Russian sources. So, yeah, yeah. That is really, really interesting. You don't see a lot of people doing that nowadays or mm -hmm. even just doing what you're doing, which is awesome, by the way. Um, do you have any advice for KU students here? Um, yeah, I mean, depending on what your job is, mm -hmm. um, that think about what other think what other skills you can actually apply. So if you're um, a journalism student or in the humanities or whatever, try to think about what extra skills or things you might need to learn. So, for example, I I was an English um, major before anything, mm -hmm. and you know writing and reading English is great and everything, and I learned how to write and structure arguments and all that. But um, I couldn't have my job if I didn't know how to speak Russian. So I yeah. did that. So um, you know, whatever it is, try to think about what you know, what you want to do, and what, how you can complement that. So you know, you don't have to take twenty different you know programming classes and languages and all that stuff, but try to think about kind of a you know an edge to it compared to other people in your program. If you want to you know get a job, get an especially um, good job and do what you want to do uh, after yeah. you graduate. Yeah, yeah, that's honestly that's what we're all <laughs> trying to do, right? <laughs> do you have anything else you want to say? Um, no, I guess all. Yeah, thank you for joining sure. us. Yeah, it was awesome talking to you. Sure, thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. And we'll be right back after this break. Champions deserve a clean campus. Don't wait for other Jayhawks to pick up your mess. Keep the University of Kansas clean. Welcome back. So now Kyle will tell us all about why North Koreans are living in the year 111, why you should not set up meetings after 6 p.m. in Ethiopia, and more. Our first fun fact for the day is in Japan. Tokyo, Japan is considered the most populated city in the world. The city features over 37 million people living in it. There is no shortage of people to meet or activities to do in Tokyo. Next up, we have Belgium. Belgium holds the world record for the longest period without a government. In 2010 to 2011, the democratic nation of Belgium went a full 589 days without an elected government. This happened when two regions in Belgium could not agree on policy issues and form a governing coalition. Thankfully, everything worked out in the end. Next, we have Wales. With the population of 3.16 million people living in the country, Wales surprisingly has four times the amount of sheep living there than actual people. This is because sheep farming is practiced extensively in Wales, with lamb and mutton being the most commonly associated meals with the country. Next is North Korea. You probably didn't know that North Korea is actually on its own timeline. They started their calendar in the year 1912, which was the year their founder, Kim Sung II, was born. So while us Western countries are living in the year 2022, our friends in North Korea are living in the year 101. Finally, we have Ethiopia. It is the oldest country in Africa, and surprisingly, it is the only country in the world that runs on a 12-hour time system. Their day starts at 6 a.m. and ends at 5.59 p.m. Ethiopians also do not practice daylight savings time, so their days stay the same all year round. Thank you for watching Accent. We'll see you soon. Ciao.